Here's what to think about in exploration and mining part three, or 2A. This is a piece of core. If I cut it in half, exactly through the middle, do I have a core duplicate or do I have something else? Today we're going to talk about core duplicates. So let's actually review what I said in the previous video and let's unpack it further. Core sample, right? You cut the cores, one action, two halves appear. To me, that's a duplicate. Now you're going to argue with this because people keep saying we don't need those core duplicates. I'm going to come back to this one, but that's going to be a different video. Well, I was going to come back to that at some point in the future, but then I found a comment on LinkedIn that made me consider I need to do this straight away. Here's the comment by Adam Anderson. He says, essaying different size of the core is not a duplicate for fuck's sakes. It's a different sample. Use a coarse crush split at the lab. Basic stuff here, Renee. How you could call that a duplicate amazes me. I would not want you managing my QC. All right, Adam, let's have a conversation about core duplicates, but let's be nice to each other, okay? The reason I left this one intentionally somewhat ambiguous is simply because I know there is more to it, as per usual. So let me unpack this for you in this video of Sunshaded Crusader of Wisdom. Uh, first, let's actually look at the term core duplicate. Did I come up with this term? Did I say the Rene Sturck Bible says that this is a duplicate? Well, I like to call it a duplicate, but actually let's review the literature because it's not coming from me. For instance, the key paper by Marat Epsilov in 2008 and a follow-up in 2011, he says, in practice, the duplicate sample can be a second blast hole sample collected from the same blast hole cone or another split of drill core. Right, so this is a key paper on quality assurance and quality control in the mining and exploration industry, and the term core duplicate is used in this paper. Here is another paper by Barry Smee et al. So there's four authors here, and this is a key paper to summarize all the best practices in quality assurance and quality control. And it's only just come out, and this summarizes previous papers, and it actually says drilling duplicates consist of either half-core or quarter-core duplicates, half of half-core sample, or a quarter-core sample of the remaining half-core sample once the primary half-core sample has been collected. So this is all about core duplicates. It's a definition. We can also look at the papers by Cliff Stanley. He talks about core duplicates and he has a lot to say about the calculation of precision. I recommend you go and read those. Those are excellent papers. Then there is the paper by Simon Domini and colleagues about core duplicates. Here is another paper by Simon Domini and colleagues about core duplicates. It's all core duplicates in almost every publication that you see. And even in the CIM guidelines that many people quote as the Bible of reference terms and so on and anything and everything else, for instance, they've got terms on verification and validation, you can actually see that they reference Murat Epsilov's paper. So they don't actually talk about core duplication, they leave the terminology they are a little bit loose, but they make reference to three key papers that I've highlighted here for you. One of which being Murat Epsilov's paper in which he defines core duplicates. And the other one by Rodin and Smith doesn't actually make any reference to the process of core splitting and duplication, so it's actually nothing in there. In other words, here the term is effectively laterally endorsed in the CIM guidelines as well. So to me, this is plenty of evidence to say, look, I'm not making this up. I believe we need to stick with this terminology, right? So this is a fundamental argument in the four camp to use that term. But there are people People. There are sampling greats and, and uh, purists in the theory of sampling space. They go out of their way not to use the term core duplicates, and they do that for a reason. I'll just point out a few or just a couple of uh, important ones for you to take notice of. Francis Petard, in his PhD thesis on the theory of sampling, talks about core splitting, but he avoids the term core duplicate almost intentionally, and I think that's important to note because he is a very uh, famous sampling person that should be listened to, and this is an excellent PhD thesis that I took a lot of value out of. Now, if you look at the JOR code, you'll find a really nuanced thing there, and I find that really interesting. They talk about field duplicates. These are your typical bags coming off the RC rig. I don't like the term field duplicates, but that's for later again. Um, I like first split duplicates of the RC rig so that we all know what we're talking about. But then there is a slash and it doesn't say core duplicates, it says second half sampling. So somebody clearly in 2010, 11, 12 when this, when this new code came out said look, you can't call it core duplicates.
duplicates because you can tell that there is a walk around here at the tomb, so it, it must be avoided for some reason. So I can see, I can sense that people don't like the tomb core duplicates as well, even though it is everywhere in the established literature. So what is the actual problem, right? Let me unpack this. It is about the purists, the theory of sampling purists. They want to reserve that term for when sampling happens. And sampling you can only do on particular materials or broken ore, if you like. And a full stick of core isn't broken ore and none of the rules apply. Therefore, it can be sampling and it can be a duplicate. I'm paraphrasing, but that's kind of what the argument is. So the other half of the argument is that core duplicates, there isn't really too much value to these because you have to ask at some point, why are you even collecting these things? So I will explain both of these issues and try to unpick them and tell you that there is value in these and why you should collect them and why a core duplicate is, is a good term. So let's unpack the first argument first. Now I agree in principle that there is an importance in nomenclature and we have to be really good in using the terms in the right instances. So in terms of duplication and broken ore, the, 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 the purest argument if you like, you can do very useful things with the calculation of average variance and if you keep your grouping and segregation errors out and your other um, incorrect sampling errors out, then fundamentally you could calculate the variance that occurs uh, at the base level that only has to do with the diameter of the grain size and the mass of the sample. And you can do some really interesting things with that if you do that for materials at different grain sizes. I won't get into the details of heterogeneity studies and what value they are in 2024 and why you should or shouldn't do them. But all of this happens on broken ore particulate matter and that's where the whole sampling theory was originally built on. So I've got time for that argument. There is value in that and naturally, and I completely agree with this argument, if you then start mixing in the variance of two sticks of core, well that's not broken material. So you can then use the calculation or whatever you calculate of the variance between two sticks of half core and compare it to broken ore. That's not what we're doing. You can't do that. Apples and oranges. Valid argument and completely true and correct. But isn't there more? Right, because why should this stuff only apply to broken ore? Why can't we talk about heterogeneity in situ? And why can't we apply the principles of good sampling to solid materials? If I split a piece of core in half, things can go wrong. Errors are introduced. Errors variance is introduced. So there is stuff to monitor, there's stuff to control, there is quality, there's things to calculate. So we can actually take the principles to competent core as well, or competent rock and solid rock. And if you think I'm making this up, again, I refer to Petard's PhD thesis, which must be 15 years ago by now. And he actually talks about this as well. He has a whole chapter dedicated on what he calls the in situ nugget effect. And he talks about how these principles also apply to solid material. Again, not something I'm making up. He even goes as far to apply these principles to establish formulas and takes those formulas about the constitutional heterogeneity one step further by acknowledging that this doesn't have to just apply to broken ore. So with this, I'm trying to explain that your argument of sampling being only applied to broken ore and that duplicates are only reserved for broken ore, I don't think that's valid. So I'd love to hear a counter argument to that, but to me, that's pretty clear. Now, the other argument Again, there's more to it, but it fundamentally comes down to that people think there is limited value in core duplicates. And again, I got time for the argument, but if you read the quote by Smee et al, it says that it is difficult to assign a quality expectation and action to be taken if there was a defined QC failure. Meaning to say, you're doing QC because you want to spot mistakes and failures. And then the, 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 the theory is that you pick those up and you fix whatever is wrong and then your system continues again and it's always in control. That is the principle of quality control. But it's very difficult to do that with two grades of two halves of core because yes, they're going to be different. And how can you tell that one is too much different than the other? It's very difficult to do. Now, this is all true, and I, for that reason, I agree with their very excellently written um, paragraph in that paper on the use of, uh, of duplicate core. Uh, but I do think there are some important cases where it does matter. And they also make reference in, in the paper that you do have to apply this in some instances, but let me tell you what those instances are. 
So if we are going to look at the value of QC, first let's reason through why we need QC on core. If you do something to get a sample out of something, or if you take a stick of core out of the ground, things go wrong. You could leave a bit of core behind in a core barrel. That's an extraction error, right? There is going to be variance in your final sample that you have sitting in your database. It doesn't reflect reality. Then it gets into the core tray. Now you have to split it. Things can go wrong when you split that core. There is the plucking effect. There are softer parts of the core, there's rubbly parts of the core, there's broken little pieces that are difficult to cut. All sorts of things can happen. In other words, you need an SOP to make sure that you prevent errors from happening. Errors and variants, SOPs, quality assurance, right? So we must have an SOP that tells you how to deal with certain core situations. So if you have QA and you think, well, Renee, that sounds reasonable, then naturally you also need the QC part because now we're going to cut it and somehow I want some checks and balances in place to make sure that all those things are happening appropriately. And yes, it is difficult to do that, but if you think about this particular situation and hopefully you see that in some instances it can be quite useful. For instance, if you have very nuggety and visible mineralization, and you don't have an ORI line that tells you where to consistently take your sample, then you could introduce selection bias. Those inexperienced geologists and techies, they, you know, they don't know what to sample if you don't tell them exactly how to sample. And if then you see visible gold with a big circle around it, VG, like in the, in the photo on the right here, and there is no cut line, and it's half core sampling, which sample do you think they will put in the bag? They're not gonna cut right through that gold, right? That's definitely not going to happen. So they're gonna cut somewhere on the side and they're gonna put the visible mineralization in the bag nine out of 10 times. Convince me otherwise, but that's what tends to happen. And this stuff happens with other mineralization styles as well, really highly nuggety sulfide mineralization, etc. In that case, you do want a quality control plot. Uh, and you see one here that I've created for a project that we worked on many years ago, and you can see the relative difference between the original grade and the duplicate grade that was occasionally taken. Okay, so you need to be very careful when you take your duplicates, don't use a grade cutoff, don't go one in 20, we can come back to all of that sort of stuff. But the point is we regularly take duplicates and then we see that the duplicate sample always came back lower grade. So in this case, there was a clear case of selection bias and that had disastrous consequences for this project. So yes, perhaps limited QC, but some QC value. So it's not necessarily that it's completely useless for a QC, although I have time for the argument that it doesn't always apply. But it's more about what you can do with the data if there isn't any QC. We do resource estimation with the data. And what we do is we take all the samples, which generally are half-core samples that sit in space. Half-core piece here, 20 meters further, there's a half-core piece there, hi, hi. And we do something with the estimation. There's a point in the middle and we want to know the grade. So we're going to average these grades together. But we don't know if this grade sits a little bit closer to that point than this point, then this sample needs to get a lower weight in the averaging technique. Okay, so what do we do? We come up with a system of weights and we're very clever about that. Well, we aren't, but people in the past have come up with a solution for this. We invent a varigram and that looks at the average variance between samples in different directions and at different distances. And then we can tell at any point in space what the weight needs to be of the sample. I can do another video on this at some point, but the point is what we use to capture that relationship between these samples is called a variogram. And a variogram is, has got some very important features, in particular, what you do at the distance zero. Because if a sample sits very close to the point you want to estimate, it needs to get a really high weight. So you better get that relationship right. But if you drill at 20 meter spacing, everything is 20 meter spaced, then you have no information of samples that sit very close to each other. So what do I do then? I know, core duplicates. This sample sits right next to this sample, not at distance zero, but at distance 2.38 centimeters, because that's NQ core. And now we can calculate the average variance within your one domain for samples at 2.38 centimeters distance. 
And if you do that, you will see that there will be differences between what your resource modelers have modeled to be the nugget and what your calculated nugget is. And in some instances, I have seen differences of up to 20% between the modeled nugget and the calculated nugget from duplicates. Now, the reason why that's important is when you start doing ordinary Kriging, there are all sorts of issues that start popping up, including negative Kriging rates. Again, it's for a different video, but all of this just helps with your assessment. It's no silver bullet, it doesn't answer all questions, it's just really good to understand something about the variance at a really short distance. That's why I use them, that's why you should use them, over and out, over to you.